garago bana garago jena jala no limites no fronteras aran sahmanleri aras chakertneri No borders, no boundaries. I don't know if music can change the world, but I think it could be one of the factors that helps change the world. If in some small way I could even help one person change even their mood, something as simple as that, from being sad to make them, to give them relief, from anxiety or or sadness i mean how amazing that you can do that the planet is very small nowadays it's getting smaller and smaller and as the population increases i think it's becoming extremely important that uh, we learn how to accept one another and uh, particularly at least tolerate one another we must come to realize that there are as many ways to live life as there are people on this planet
In a year when two awakening giants pause to look back and look ahead, a year when India, that ancient culture but young nation, celebrated 50 years of independence, when China celebrated the return of Hong Kong, a Greek-born, American resident, composer-musician Yanni Chrysamalis set about on an ambitious musical enterprise. He would be the first to stage a major concert at India's Taj Mahal, the first to do so at China's Forbidden City. With him on these travels were 45 musicians, a far-reaching international cast whose talent and imagination had made important contributions to the new works he would record in India and China. Any time? Any time. Oh, okay. Mi nombre es Ramón Estañero. Nací en Lima, Perú. From Peru, Ramón Estañero brought a sound and sensibility, gentle and optimistic. Conductor Armen Anassian is from the former Soviet Republic of Armenia. When the Bolsheviks won the revolution and toppled the Tsar, they just went around sticking their flag everywhere and uh, just basically collecting these different peoples. And, uh, and the overall plan was to make one giant Russian nation. And uh, evidently, it, that didn't work. David Hudson's didgeridoo is a connection to the long gone ancestors who first settled Australia. It wasn't until 1967 that Aboriginal people were allowed to vote in our own country. All Aboriginal people are asking in Australia is that we get we are given recognition that we are the original people from that country and that um, we are first Australians. Mi nombre es Pedro Eustache y nací en Caracas, Venezuela, Suramérica. Pedro Eustache, his instrument and extension of his demonstrative personality is from polyglot Caracas. In Venezuela, people are very, there's a word for that, versatile, if I could say, very flexible. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Violinist Karen Briggs knows city and country, raised in New York, born in the Virgin Islands. Ming Freeman. Ming Freeman, born in Taiwan, conjures acoustic sounds from electronic machines. Yanni's home is a postcard, mountains on top of beaches, in a horseshoe around a wide bay. He was born in Kalamata, five hours south of Athens. 
All Greek schoolchildren know this town. The independence movement began here two centuries ago, stirred by a people who would not be conquered. Today, his parents live just outside town in a home bought by an immensely grateful son. The relatives thought that they were nuts when they bought us the piano, to have a piano in the house, because he felt at the age of six and seven years old, even though he felt earlier, we should have done it. But uh, it was the time where the kids can learn the fastest. Piano was very expensive in Greece then, in comparison with what with uh, our uh, income. But he figured out how to get a loan and how to do it. And I knew at the time that he bought the piano, he didn't have money left to go to the movies, or he even stopped going to the local cafe to have coffee. If I buy it 10 years later, it will be useless. No, nothing, nothing can, can be done 10 years later. They have to start right now. And uh, we started at the right moment. Home was Lord Duvironos, Lord Byron Street, the center of town, two blocks from the beach. Three children altogether, and Sotiri and Felitsa Chrysamalis wanted George and Yanni and Anda to go to college in America. To do this, they had to sell their house. So he, in, in the middle of his 50s, he would have to go rent a home and never knew if he was going to ever have enough money again to buy a house. Um, we're talking altruism here. I mean, he did. And obviously my mother, I keep talking about my father, obviously they both were involved in the decisions. Um, both of them felt they should do what was necessary to be done in the moment in time where it was supposed to be done. That kind of love that comes in you, is never goes away, it never dies, it never diminishes itself, it lasts forever. And that's why I talk about love in my concerts because I know, I felt it, I have it in me, it's the only constant. I'm telling him, Yanni, take care of Yanni, too. Not only music. <laughs> does, he, yeah. does he listen to you? Oh, sometimes. <laughs> you know him. <laughs> He's doing anything he likes to do. <laughs> My father would take me up for these long walks up in the Greek mountains. And during those times, he would try to teach me about life. He was always trying to teach me simplicity and appreciation for nature. He liked to say that the best things in life are available to any human being. So you see, greatness has nothing to do with success or money or possessions. as you move west to east, from the edge of the Mediterranean to the waters of the sacred Ganges. Varanasi, an open-air temple for the living and the dying, is thought to be the oldest inhabited city on Earth. Older than history, it is said, older than legend. A city alive at least 1,000 years before Christ. It is the inner heart of Hinduism, to bathe in these waters is to be blessed for a lifetime. To be cremated here 
is to provide the battered soul final release from the wheel of birth and death. Long, long ago, a prince who had renounced a life of luxury came to Varanasi, and in a nearby deer park, he gave his first sermon. Here, Siddhartha Gautama, the awakened one, the Buddha, told his first disciples of how he had seen a way to end suffering and discover nirvana, the great peace. The Ganges, whose waters enrich so much of the country's soil, flows from the heavens far north, and India's abiding spirituality is evident all along its great river. In Haridwar, at the beginning of the Himalayan foothills, there is an elaborate service. Not annually, not monthly, not weekly, but every night on these steps, they chant the Ganga Arati, a hymn to Mother Ganges. The faithful are unexceptional here. North of Rishikesh, on top of a mountain, a temple keeper for decades awaits what has long been only a trickle of pilgrims. But each day, he can look out on the ever snow-capped Himalayas, the world's ceiling, where amidst the clouds, India's sacred river begins. India is an illogical idea. One divinity, many gods. One nation, contradictory faiths. 18 languages, 25 states. Mountains and deserts and tropics. Poverty without despair. A million mutinies, a miraculous union. I think of all the places we've ever been, I've appreciated Indian culture uh, more than any other place we've been, just because it was so, so colorful and so uh, strong in India, and they're so proud of it. And I don't think we've been anywhere where that's been so outstanding. India was uh, a sensory overload by every sense imaginable. Uh, I was, every day I was shocked with something, you know, be it the Taj Mahal, its beauty, uh, and the contrast of uh, the poverty uh, outside our hotel. It was just overbearing and overwhelming. Every day I, I dealt with that, and um, I will never forget India. Never, never forget India. I sat down a couple of years ago and I uh, and thought about <laughs> where would the next concert take place. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, you're you're trying to select places that would lend themselves to to good pictures. At the same time, the Taj Mahal, being what it is and what it symbolizes, it's a symbol of love, um, had a special attraction to me. And the other magical place was the Forbidden City, but I. At the time, it seemed like an impossible dream, you know. Both of these locations seemed impossible. <clears throat> I didn't even have high hopes that they would even become a reality. These places are very inspiring. They're inspiring to me, and I think they're inspiring to the public in general, uh, because they point in one direction. And that is human beings can be great if we choose to. Um, they are uh, reminders of past greatness. It is linked to the Holy River by a tributary of the Ganges. So for Hindus, it touches the divine. But this structure of immense beauty, this symbol of India, is better described as a welcome stranger. The Taj Mahal is the work of an invader of a Shah of the Mughal dynasty, warriors from Central Asia whose descendants included Genghis Khan. 
The Shah Jahan was a Muslim from a foreign faith, and his monument was the testimony of his love for his Persian queen, the Mumtaz Mahal. She died in 1631 at age 39, shortly after giving birth to their 14th child. His memorial, her tomb, required a far-flung workforce of 20,000. It took 21 years, precious stones from Russia, Tibet, and China, and a collective creative genius still unsurpassed. The Mughal rulers understood beauty, but were taught treachery. Shah Jahan's son would grab power by killing his three brothers and imprisoning his father. The builder of the Taj spent his final years confined to the Agra fort, tantalized by a haunting view of his white marbled poem to a lost love. India's rivers rise with the monsoon season, then slowly dwindle. Yani's performance at the Taj was scheduled for spring when the receding Yamuna would create a temporary beach, a momentary concert site. The project had no precedent. No major musical act had ever played at the Taj. Roads had to be paved, bridges borrowed, and 180 tons of equipment transported by air, land, and sea. Ram Kohli and Venkat Vardhan, early supporters, were the principal organizers inside India. We had to create everything from scratch, the entire infrastructure. I put almost 10 months work. Sometimes I worked for 18 hours a day, sometimes I worked for 10 hours a day, but it was always work, work, work and work. I think I just had faith in it and uh, there is a God above for the hard work we put in. Sometimes my wife says, what the hell are you doing? Uncertainty followed this unlikely project. The merits of Yani at the Taj were debated for months by India's democracy of voices. Yani should have his privacy and should not jump from the Acropolis to Taj Mahal, from Taj Mahal to Agra Fort. Yani, he, get, he brings the ambience into it. He says that India has arrived, really arrived. Let music grow slowly and peacefully. I am not mad keen on publicity rather than music. We need a change basically and this guy is, uh, for me, it's a dream come true. One does get the feeling with Yanni that there's an enormous amount of publicity seeking. You can't let music grow with all this television jazz. If he gets inspiration from the Taj, why not compose something and then play it in front of the Taj? Taj as a backdrop is very beautiful. Yani is great. It's a tragedy. I think so. Yani is good man. I don't think Yani is very good. Basically, it appeals to people because it touches your heart. It is very smooth music. It's very boring. Sometimes it doesn't crescendo. Go. Sometimes they come down. I would say I'm against the Western music. And I've always been interested in Western uh, music, and I appreciate it a lot. And even and without the Acropolis and even without the Taj, his music sounds so exotic. Yeah, I think he should be playing at Taj because Taj can make him famous as he is making Taj famous all over the world. Proceeds from ticket sales and sponsorships. In the end, $2.7 million were to be donated to a Taj preservation fund. A local tailor relayed the word on the street. Like many, he suspected government officials would steal the money. Somehow, he said, they needed to be made accountable. Meanwhile, a local government official talked of new vistas. And pious cows. A new vista, a new field has been opened. Because uh, up till now, we used to think that Taj is a pious cow which cannot be touched. In the Taj backyard, roads were improved by a well balanced workforce, pontoon bridges placed across the shrunken Yamuna by a festive, tidy Indian army brigade. I think the biggest concern of uh, mine as well as my production people was the stage itself. If we dig for four feet below this, we hit water. So uh, we had to devise a way with what was available here to put up such a big stage to withstand the load that was given to us, which we achieved. With a week to go, two petitions to stop the concert were rejected by India's Supreme Court. 
the court satisfied that this extravagant sound and light show would not harm the monument. It took him a year to accomplish what he describes as a lifelong dream after fighting off allegations that his concert at the Taj Mahal would irreparably damage the monument, Greek composer Yanni has finally been given the go-ahead to perform in Agra. A lot of the objections were raised 10 days before the concert, which was a little curious. Well, personally, I feel that most of the people who opposed it were looking for personal publicity. If they would have come and discussed the details with us, me and the organizers, me, Yanni, and other people, we would have satisfied them. The last threat was the most disconcerting. Watermelon farmers, unable to cultivate the beach area being used for the concert, said they hadn't been compensated. It was reported they were prepared to torch themselves. I think he obviously made a good story for the media because uh, farmers burying themselves at the Yanni concert sells newspapers. <laughs> and uh, I wanted to meet with the farmers in person because I wanted to see what was going on. And uh, I ended up meeting seven people that were incredible. Uh, one in particular that I had a very strong connection with, which seemed to be their spokesperson. His name was Bipti Ram. He said uh, that he felt maybe they were not getting the money uh, that they felt their crop was worth, but God is great and that God would take care of them the following year by giving them a better crop. At that point, <laughs> he just took my heart. It was an experience that, that uh, is probably parallels to the actual performance at the Taj Mahal. It was as powerful for me, that, that meeting with these farmers, these people. This was the scene at twilight before the first concert. For so many in India, every act, small or large, has a connection with the divine. Backstage, Yanni greeted one of his key political supporters, Ramesh Bandari. Bandari governs the vast state of Uttar Pradesh, population 150 million. As we all know, things do not come easily in life. This program also did not come easily. His performance is going to be a tribute to the Taj. A tribute to perhaps not only one of the most greatest wonders of the world, but a tribute to the symbolism of harmony, of peace, and of eternal love. I, I question sometimes whether the United States would allow someone to come from another country and set up a band in front of, let's say, the Statue of Liberty and rope it off from the public and hire the U.S. Army and allow them to perform. I, I wonder if that could be done. Turning around to see the Taj Mahal deeply affected me. My inner being was very moved. You're always going to have your critics, and someone's going to smash you. So it doesn't really matter. He wanted to do this. It was his dream. And uh, he was able to do it. And I think that's, that's pretty amazing. I think some of the objections came out of ignorance. Um, and, I, and that's why, essentially, the Supreme Court allowed us to do what we did. I felt that my music was appropriate to be performed at the Taj Mahal. Here we go. The moment I'll remember most, on the 20th of March, when Yanni came to stage, I almost cried and I had tears in my eyes. I was the most satisfied person on this earth.
This image had never been seen before. For the first time in its nearly four centuries, the Taj was lit at night. The live broadcast of the show reached a small Rajasthani village hundreds of miles to the west. For some of these villages, it was the first time, the first time, they had seen or heard of the Taj Mahal. Well, I think it's essentially the celebration of freedom and what I think is thematically the most significant, which is the triumph of the human spirit, whether it is getting independence, getting freedom, whether it is Yani, going through all the various protests or, you know, uncertainties that happen to crop up, you know, finally the triumph of the human spirit. The Great Wall of China is the world's most famous boundary, not as old as many believe, and a spectacular failure. Before there was such a thing as a wall defining much of China's northern border, many of the country's ancient rulers believed engagement with the surrounding nomads was the more prudent course. Only the inward-looking Ming Dynasty, ruling from 1368 to 1644, truly attempted to contain the barbarians beyond with a vast wall unlike any built before. It danced like a dragon along the frontier, built by thousands, stretching hundreds and hundreds of miles. But lonely soldiers often traded with the enemy, finding peace more profitable. Others accepted bribes. And when the fast-moving horse-driven Mongols successfully invaded in 1550, they avoided the wall altogether. There were still bricks to be laid in this Fear Thy Neighbor construction campaign. Now the wall is under siege by tourists, millions per year. Yanni would make the obligatory visit on a late afternoon in May, two months after the performances in India. He and his orchestra we're in the final days of their China tour. I, it's actually, it reminds me of Greece, the mountains, the way it feels here. It's just quite beautiful. It's something that you don't think of when you think of the wall. Because as you say, it could be a sign of exclusion. And I, I, I mean, it's something I never, even the jackass down there <laughs> sounds the same as the Greek mountains. There's a big explosion in this country. Big explosion, and, and it's, uh, I think we should be happy for them. I asked my orchestra and the band about what's their impression of China, and the first thing that comes out of their mouth is, we're very surprised, we had no idea. At the Peace Hotel in Shanghai, the old jazz band has been reborn. Their gig was suspended, their instruments hidden during the darkness of the Cultural Revolution. 
Now, another revolution is underway, prompted by a simple but astonishing remark from the late Deng Xiaoping. To get rich is glorious. Shanghai is leading China's bungee jump into capitalism. In the summer of 1997, the city was supporting 22,000 construction sites. Across the river, around the clock shifts, and billions of dollars are transforming farmland into a jungle of skyscrapers. An instant Manhattan. Shanghai is changing every day. Hope you have a good time here, and we should come here again. Thank you. Yanni played two dates in Shanghai, then traveled south for two shows in Guangzhou, another city in a mad makeover. Here, food rules, fresh and in great variety. In Guangzhou, the Chinese say, the locals will eat anything with four legs, except perhaps a table, and anything that flies, short of an airplane. And that's all the Cantonese I know, but... <laughs> uh, but I promise next year when I come back, I would have practiced a lot more, I would have learned a lot more. I feel I've been taken by the U.S. media in some way because I lived in the U.S. for 24 years now. I had no idea China was like this. So I said to myself, what's wrong with this picture? How come we're not aware that China is really flourishing? It looks like uh, my information about China was wrong, you know? I expected something different, but such a great country, so far what I saw is just amazing. seems to have um, room to breathe and uh, live their lives more in tune with their needs and what they want. I visited my family in Guangzhou. Um, I noticed a definite change in their consciousness. Um, they were much happier people and there was much more hope in their eyes. Hope is something that they have now for the future, and it's a wonderful thing. No sound is but a song, no movement but a dance. Beijing opera is one of the world's oldest art forms, a riot of color and symbolism and percussion. But it is noise to China's young, and it may die in a generation. In the western district of Beijing, there is a school which addresses these new tastes, the center of electroacoustic music of China. I began doing music right after college, full time, and it took me 15 years of hard work, sometimes 12 hours a day. In a small classroom, a curiosity from the West came to be quizzed. A musician who did not read music, who instead used self-made hieroglyphics concocted in his boyhood. Obviously, these are si similar in music. They're bars. Right. Would, right. Um, a little sign of, over a note like this says that this note underneath that is the highest note on the bar. 
I started doing it when I was eight or nine years old. And at the beginning, it was just chords and a few notes. Eventually, I learned how to do rhythm in there also, the, the syncopation. This is the beginning of a piece of music called Keys to Imagination. Um, it goes like this. No, no, no. That's it, right there. The students also knew that this traveler with his own musical language uses an odd musical math, pieces which sometimes waltz in seven eighths. One, two, three. So, if you were in Greece, that's where you would dip. You know, it says one, one, two, one, two, one, two, three. There is one part of the bar that, as you're counting, it gets a little longer. So there's strong points in the bar. Much like in rock and roll or anywhere else, they say boom, pa, boom, pa, right? This one is a little more complex. It's a little more flighty. And Santorini has that beat, chunk, 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 you know, but it's faster. Chunk, 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 one, two, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, one, two, that's all it is. I'll start it. We're gonna, we're gonna speed up. Yeah, okay, it's just gonna go one, two, one, two, one, two, three. Yeah! All right, great. Have you guys been practicing sevens or what? <laughs> <laughs> It was thought to be the center of the world, a paradise on earth made for one man by a million laborers five centuries ago. An imperial city, a forbidden city, closed to common souls. 175 acres, 800 buildings, 9,000 chambers. A surreal life of eunuchs and concubines and daily sumptuous feasts centered around an emperor who ruled with the mandate of heaven. It was constructed in the Ming Dynasty, the era of wall building and supreme mistrust. And this cocoon of palaces would house a succession of weak, detached rulers. The dynasty was ultimately toppled by a foreign invasion, Manchurians from the north taking advantage of internal dissent. The last true Chinese emperor hung himself from a tree on a hill overlooking a paradise that could not last. Once the citizens of China could not even approach its walls. Now, on a spring night, the gates of the Forbidden City had been opened for a foreigner's music, a first for a Western pop act.
It's almost midnight for this millennium, and the world's two most populous nations are emerging from an isolation of their own making. When British rule concluded 50 years ago, India decided to outline its future without the assistance of the powers beyond its borders. An identity needed to be carved, a social contract acknowledged. And this still young nation, nearing a billion people, amidst so much diversity, continues the great adventure of sustaining democracy. The door opens only slowly with suspicion, because things of the West once unleashed come in waves, this culture of instant gratification that could corrupt India's soul, that might remind so many with so little about earthly treasures beyond their reach. China, too, has a universe inside its borders. That much of its multitude lives with a measure of pride and dignity is rather remarkable. In the last five decades, divine misfortunes, flood and drought and earthquakes have been accompanied by incredible man-made misery. The notion of a collective will, of a fight for survival, fades as the citizens are told they can rightly pursue a philosophy of personal enrichment. What comes next for China is perhaps the most intriguing and most important question before an ever-shrinking world. It's our Aboriginal flag from Australia. So black represents the people, yellow represents the sun, red was the blood that was shed. And a hand, hand is simply, uh, means good luck, keep the spirits away. Uh, yeah. I think we cannot be confusing governments with the people um, and ideologies with the people. And uh, from my travels around the world, I have found that people around the world are the same. He listens to his own voice, his own heart. Somehow the gift that Yanni has been given is uh, of a language, of a voice that can transcend, you know, limits. So, after all, this son of Greece was able to play his music in settings of sweet resonance, in lands of a billion faces. One of the last songs in the program was Niki Nana, We Are One.
what, you know, what I see in the, in, in the rest of the world is that um, there's so much fighting and squabbling happening. And for someone to get off his backside and at least show China, India, America, and bring all these people together, it shows that we are uniting cultures through our music. I love, I love the. Um, uh, 我非常喜欢那种特殊的感觉，好像是从来没有碰到过的一样。I like this kind of special feeling, said one concert goer. It is a completely new style which we have not known before in China. I hope there are more new things from foreign countries, so that we can learn. If we can use music as a tool of communication throughout the world, the world will become more beautiful and peaceful. Yeah, welcome.
Thank you, thank you very much. I am deeply honored to be performing at the Taj Mahal, as I am deeply honored to be part of India's celebration of the 50th anniversary of its independence. It has been a dream of mine to visit India and present my music, to be doing it for the first time in this magnificent and magical place makes it a once-in-a-lifetime unforgettable event for me. For the past year and a half, I've been isolated in the studio, creating, composing the music in anticipation of this event, and it's during this event that the new album will be created.
Chinese I know for now, but, but I promise when I come back next year I would have learned a lot more. It is indeed a great honor for me to be performing in the Forbidden City. It is one of the greatest architectural achievements in the world, and it is perhaps man's attempt to imagine heaven on earth. For the past few weeks I have been touring China and I have been deeply moved by the warmth and by, by the acceptance of the Chinese people. And I know that when I returned home I would have been changed by my experiences in China. So, we will continue now with a new composition. This one is called Renegade.
excited for me and flutes. And Karen Griggs on violin. I would like to introduce to you now one of the newest members in our band. His name is Ramon Staniaro, he is from Peru, and he plays the guitar. That's a very small guitar you got there, Ramon. I told you not to wash it today. I think it must have shrunk. But that was really, it's a, uh, it's a very beautiful South American instrument called the charango. It's a very happy instrument. <laughs> Ramon introduced me to this instrument a few months ago, and uh, I just decided to open the next uh, piece of music using the charango. This one is called the Waltz in 7-8.
Wing of Freedom on your keyboards. I remember when I was young, my father would take me for these long walks up on the Greek mountains. And during those times, he would try to teach me about life. He was always trying to teach us simplicity and appreciation for nature. And he liked to say that the best things in life are available to everyone because they're inside us, like truth, imagination, creativity, love, kindness, compassion. So you see, greatness has nothing to do with success or money or possessions. The next piece of music celebrates the greatness that's inherent in all of us. It will feature our conductor, Mr. Armin Anassian, on violin. And it's called Tribute.
Lisa Fumora, Jumper. <laughs> the next piece of music, believe it or not, was inspired by a nightingale. I often listen to nature because I learn balance from listening to nature. I remember a few years ago I was in Venice, Italy, and one of these birds kept coming by my window every sunset, and she proceeded to sing her song. And it was so beautiful, I was completely mesmerized by it. These birds have such a tremendous vocabulary and rhythms and melodies. And I thought, what a pity that we couldn't communicate, we couldn't speak each other's language. It wasn't until many years later, when I was introduced to the Chinese flute, that I realized that this instrument, particularly in the higher registers, has a lot of the tonal characteristics of the nightingale. And so I decided to write a song using the Chinese flute. The song will begin with our Venezuelan friend, whom you met a little earlier tonight, Pedro Eustache, playing the Chinese flute. It's called Nightingale, and I'd like to dedicate it to you.
Of all the forces that are exerted on us over our lifetime, at least for me, love has been the most powerful of all. As our population increases, our planet becomes smaller and smaller. It's therefore very important that we all learn how to love and accept each other. Whenever that's not possible, at least learn how to tolerate one another. I learned that very valuable lesson early on in life because of changing cultures. I moved from Greece to the United States, and to this day, people ask me, are you Greek or are you American? I'm a human being, just like all of us, and then I'm Greek or American or Chinese or Indian. You must come to understand and realize that there are as many ways to live life as there are people on this planet. 2,500 years ago, Socrates said that the perfect human being is all human beings put together. It is a collective. It is a we. It is all of us together that make perfection. The next piece of music talks all about that, and I would like to dedicate it to Shah Jahan and Mumtaz Mahal and to the architects and engineers and sculptors that loved the pieces of marble into this architectural wonder of beauty we call the Taj Mahal. And also, I would like to dedicate it to all the people in India who loved this concert into existence and thus enabling us and thus enabling us to send a very powerful and much needed message around the world a message of love, unity, acceptance and tolerance the song will begin once again with our Venezuelan friend Pedro Eustache playing a 2500 year old Armenian instrument called the Duduk it's called Love is All
Good girl. Good girl. You know, in looking for the best musicians in the world, I ended up with the United Nations. The musicians in this orchestra represent a great many of the world's nations, and without them, I couldn't have my music materialize. I would like to introduce to you now our symphony orchestra. Okay, the next piece of music is a celebration. It celebrates the bond that exists among all people. I mean, I know as our cities become larger, busier, faster, noisier, we tend to go numb to the fact that we're all connected after all. So why don't you join us in the celebration? This one is called Nikki Nana. We are one. <laughs> 